So I'm going to launch it. The first question is, how often do you incorporate the arts into your classroom? And the second is, have you ever used the arts to speak truth to power yourself? So go ahead and answer. Welcome, Estella. It's nice to see you. Okay. And we'll close the poll in five, four, three, two, and and poll. Can everyone see the results? Mm -hmm. Did it work? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes, it is. Awesome. Okay. All right. So, welcome everybody. This is our second session of Zooming for Human Rights Education, and we're so excited to have you with us today. Um, I know most of you on here, you know who I am, I'm Jenny. I'm the Speak Truth to Power Arts Program Manager, and I'd like the rest of the team to introduce themselves as well. Hey, I think everyone knows me already on the call here. It's Adnan, Managing Director of Human Rights Ed. Since we know everyone here, I think it might turn into more of a dialogue later <laughs> on. But, <laughs> but yeah, good to see everyone today. Hi everyone, this is Karen, Program Director, Speak Truth to Power. Hi everybody, this is Laura Osterndorf, Training Manager for Speak Truth to Power. And for those of you who are new today, we'll serve as an introduction to Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights, as well as the Speak Truth to Power program, and we'll do an overview of our arts programs today. We also want to recognize all of the educators who are with us today. We have so many of our lead educators on. I see Pam, I see Anthony, Suzanne, Chris, Estella. Uh, who else is here? Dick. Yay! Without you all, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. So we're so grateful to have you on here today. Um, and we know that all of you are facing the challenging, challenges of navigating distance learning. And at its heart, Speak Truth to Power has always been a program which celebrates and supports teachers. We hope that we can lessen the burden of teachers to create new material by providing resources as well as emotional support by building a virtual global community of human rights educators. We also want to remind all of you on the call that you are human rights defenders of the right to education. And um, we're not going to mute you today, so if you have any comments that you want to make in the midst of the presentation, please feel free to chime in. And after the session, um, we will forward all of the links to you. Chris, we talked to you about this already. Some of the links aren't functioning, but they will be shortly. Um, and everything will be emailed to you all so you can access all of our upcoming virtual events. Okay. So today, we will introduce you to RFK Human Rights and the Speak Truth to Power program review our arts programs and learn how art can be a tool for students to become human rights defenders, review our free arts focused materials, and hear from one of our amazing Speak Truth to Power lead educators teaching the arts through human rights lens. That's Estella. We're so happy to have her here today. Estella. Okay, so let's start with Robert F. Kennedy. Um, the organization was founded in 1968 to carry on Robert F. Kennedy's commitment to a more just and peaceful world. His legacy reflects a belief in the power of the individual to bend history and the power of many to break down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. Robert F. Kennedy believed in the power of the individual, that it only takes one person with courage and conviction to make a positive difference. And right now I'm going to share a bit of Bobby Kennedy's vision um, through the medium of film. Each time a man stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring. Those ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. Few will have the greatness to bend history but each of us can work to change a small portion of the event, and then the total, all of these acts will be written in the history of this generation. So 
So most of you have seen this before. That was Robert F. Kennedy's Day of Affirmation Address given at the University of Cape Town, South, Af South Africa on June 6, 1966, on the University's Day of Reaffirmation of Academic and Human Freedom. Um, as U.S. Attorney General, Senator, and Presidential Candidate, Bobby Kennedy fought for civil rights, political rights, peace, and rights for disadvantaged populations. And at this point, I would like to turn it over to Karen Robinson, our Speak Truth to Power Program Director, who will give you a bit of an organizational overview as well as an introduction to the human rights framework. Hi, everyone. I'm just going to echo Jenny's welcome to everyone. And um, it's really lovely to see so many of our lead educators. Um, and uh, I appreciate that we're doing a lot of zooming and so much of this you've seen before. So I'll go through it quickly so we can get into a dialogue. And um, I just want to welcome in particular Mitra because you're new to us. I, I, I'm not, I can't remember if you were on the last one. So welcome. Um, and if you feel like we've gone through some of this introductory stuff a little too quickly, always feel free to ping us and reach out and, um, and ask any follow up that may be needed. But um, as most of you know, um, and I think always important to kind of revisit the Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights was founded soon after his assassination, um, led by Ethel, family, and friends to really carry on his, his legacy. Um, our president now is Carrie Kennedy, his daughter, um, and really, you know, working alongside uh, lead, lead educators and community partners and lawyers and advocates and entrepreneurs and artists our goal is to really promote, protect, and defend human rights globally. Um, and when you look at this graphic, you see kind of how we strategically have framed that within RFK human rights. And the vision, kind of that the roof over us constantly, is the quote by Escalese that says, to tame the savageness of man and make gentle the life of this world. Right? And he gave that speech um, in India, that was from his speech in Indianapolis and really reminded us all that the task before us is, is pretty significant. Within our frame, within our strategic frame, um, resting on his legacy, we have four key pillars, government, business, everyone is a human rights defender and heroes. So government, we work to um, advocate for change both internationally and domestically. Um, we look to advance litigation that changes the, the human rights uh, framework uh, internationally, whether it's working on civic space or rights of the wom women um, or LGBTQ. We take cases before international bodies, regional bodies, to try to, again, change international human rights law so that it is protecting, promoting, and defending um, people, humans. Um, domestically, we've invested quite a bit of effort focused on uh, criminal justice reform, looking specifically at bail um, and kind of incarceration in the United States and the many, and many, many, many challenges that are surrounding that. In business, we focus on a program called Compass, which you know, which really seeks to um, introduce to fiduciaries and folks in the, the business world the human rights lens. So as they're thinking about how they invest, where they invest, the, the overall um, construct of their business, they have that human rights information as, as one piece that informs how they do business. Um, everyone is a human rights defender. This is where Speak Truth to Power really sits with young leaders. Um, young leaders is our program uh, primarily on college campuses where uh, university students can select an issue and really take a uh, focused uh, action on that issue. And we also have a young leaders professional group, um, particularly in New York, that has been very active on bail reform. And then of course, Speak Truth to Power, where we all are human rights defenders. And then finally, Heroes, recognizing um, through the Ripple of Hope Award, through our Human Rights Award, through uh, Book and Journalism Award, folks who have really uh, really deserve being recognized for the steps they've taken, the risks they've taken, the courage and the, and the hope that they demonstrate through their work, through their writing, through, through their being. Next slide. So 
I'm not going to dive into this too, too much because I think most of you on here have actually presented this already. Um, but it is just critically important for all of us at RFK to remember that our work is grounded in human rights, right? That these principles, these I, ideas, these laws, these standards that are ours because we are human, right? And that the belief that human rights are those basic standards without which people cannot without which people cannot live in dignity. And that at the end of the day, the dignity of all members of the human family are really at the, at the foundation of, of taming that savage beast, right? Um, and that human rights principles hold up the vision of a free and just and peaceful world. And then always going back again to kind of our vision statement for the organization. Again, I'm not gonna go too deeply in this because I'd rather us get to the conversation about the arts and so many of you have done these presentations before. But of course, um, if we're talking about human rights, our work is grounded in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the 30 articles um, that were advanced after World War II, really the first document that the UN put forward after its own, um, its own organization and really sets forth these principles, these ideas, this um, inspirational, way that we can all live together. And there are two articles that I really want to highlight as we think about human rights and the arts. Really Article 19 that talks about freedom of expression and Article 27 which explicitly mentions the arts in the context of cultural life. And so you know when we think about human rights it's not just from the learning and the lens but it is directly related to and speaks to what we're going to talk about, talk about today. Um, as far as human rights education and the arts as a platform to learn, to engage, and to bring about change. So that all brings us to our program, Speak Truth to Power, with which most of you are pretty familiar. Um, but just to reflect and reiterate, Speak Truth to Power is a multi-dimensional human rights education program that provides powerful storytelling and interactive learning to provide this generation with the knowledge and tools necessary to end and prevent human rights abuses from around the world. And this storytelling and learning aspect includes lesson plans, as well as contests, other arts materials, and all of those contribute to mindful action. Um, you can see below here that our work has inspired an estimated 5. million students, teachers, and other individuals with the capacity to reach far more from our free and online resources. But what we also want to reflect upon is that Speak Truth to Power not only seeks to provide knowledge and understanding of human rights advocacy, but we also want to redefine traditional education standards in order to create a paradigm shift so that morality, ethics, and human rights are central parts of our learning environment and will also help us solve the world's most pressing human rights issues. I think we can go to the next slide. So here you'll see the scope of Speak Truth to Power around the globe. We have a presence in more than 20 countries, which means that we've either done trainings there or that we have an international office there. Hi, Anthony in Spain. Um, and those affiliates carry out our work as well. We also have other arts and artists in all those different countries, some of which we'll hear about later. Um, and then we also have a representation of human rights defenders from all over the world. And this provides us with an array of cultures and ideas that represent the diversity of human rights. So as you may know, all of our lesson plans begin with the story of a human rights defenders and then have the interactive activities of those defender stories, um, some of which we'll go over later. Oops, we can go to the next slide. These are our main programmatic objectives of STTP outlined here. The first of which involves building educator capacity to ingrain human rights education into the fabric of their pedagogy. This is going to include training of educators in human rights education, as well as the creation of human rights education assets, including lesson plans. 
Um, the next programmatic objective involves reinforcing attitudes, mindsets, and behaviors in the learning process for all participants so that they advance and protect human rights in everyday lives. And this is really where the integration of social and emotional learning and mindfulness competencies come explicitly into the learning process and in the activities. And then the final programmatic objective of Speak Truth to Power involves all participants identifying as human rights defenders through mindful action aligned with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So this is going to include um, the Become a Defender activities, Become a Defender toolkits and trainings, um, basically all of the materials that students and teachers need to community organize, advocate, and conduct individual acts of service. This can also include the arts piece, which Jenny will reflect upon later. And all of these activities are aligned to support uh, the UDHR, as we discussed, but also the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So we can go to the next slide. Awesome. Thank you, Karen and Laura. So this brings us to our approach. And what sets Speak Truth to Power apart is our commitment to telling stories. All of our lessons start with the stories of over 60 human rights defenders with our work based in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We employ the words, opinions, and courage of these defenders as entry points into understanding and promoting universal rights law, human rights law, standards, and advocacy. Our stories guide us to find unity and commonality with other individuals, regardless of their experience, sharing the narratives of people with different cultural experiences. And this helps us build bridges between people with different beliefs. And the arts also guide us to find unity and commonality with other individuals, which brings us to our human rights defenders. Um, so these are four of our human rights defenders out of our 60 plus lessons on our website. And let's see. So the first image you see here is of Sunita Elizade. And these are all human rights defenders who speak truth, the, speak truth to power through the arts. And Sunita is a young Afghan rapper working to end child marriage. She witnessed the injustice of the world around her and found poetry, photography, and music to be an outlet, an outlet for self-expression. When she was 14, she heard an Iranian rapper on the radio and decided to try rap. She'd never done it before. And she felt that the, she, she really could relate to the beat and felt like it was the best way to really express how she was feeling. When she was 16, she was told she had to um, get married because the family was in need of money, but she, that's not how she saw her life unfolding. And so she wrote the rap um, Daughters for Sale, which some of you may have seen, it went viral. She had the help of a filmmaker who recorded her story and made this amazing music video. Um, you can actually find it. I'll talk about our partnership with Discovery later, but you'll be able to see her vignette and part of her music video in that vignette. I highly recommend that you check it out. And the video that she created was seen by a nonprofit organization called the Strong Heart Group, who actually helped us create the lesson plan that is on our website and reached out to her and facilitated her move to the United States, where she's currently attending college. Such a cool story. Um, the second image is of Aaron Mabin, and you can find him in our 50th anniversary lesson plans. He is an art activist and former professional football player from Baltimore, so he's kind of local. He's, he's not too far away. Um, Aaron had a five-year career in the NFL before making the decision to walk away from sports entirely to pursue a career as a professional artist, activist, author, educator, and community organizer. His art, photography, and writing deal with socially relevant themes and issues drawn from his own personal experiences as a pro athlete, but also as a young black man in America. And he uses his platform and gifts to advocate for racial and economic equality, arts education and programming in the underprivileged communities across the country. The third image is of Elie Vassell, which I'm sure all of you know who he is. In World War II, he was deported to the German concentration camps and his parents and his sister, um, passed there. Um, in 1945, he was liberated and taken to Paris where he studied and worked as a journalist. And then in 1958, he published his first book, Night, which many of you may have read, which is a memoir of his experiences in the concentration camps. And then in his lifetime, he authored approximately 30 books, which mostly have to do with 
um, groups who have suffered persecution and death because of their religion, race, or national origin. And the final photo you see is of Dean Obadala, who is featured in our, our Islamophobia lesson plan. He uses um, comedy and film to foster understanding and dispel microceptions, microconceptions of um, about Muslims. And so he speaks out um, about discrimination and talks a lot about Islamophobia. He co-directed and co-produced the award-winning award -winning documentary, The Muslims Are Coming. Um, there are three other activists in our Islamophobia lesson plan and you should check it out. It's a great lesson plan. So those are four of our um, artists that we shine light on who speak truth to power through the arts. And that brings us to our arts programs. So Speak Truth to Power is rooted in telling the stories of the bravest people on earth, four of whom you just heard about, where stories and words of our defenders evoke change within students so that they're able to understand that no matter how old they are, no matter where they're from, that they can absolutely be defenders of human rights and, and bring about change in this world. Our arts programs offer students opportunities to use arts as a tool to tell important stories and speak truth to power using their authentic voices where students can creatively address and solve problems in their communities and the world. By using the arts to find creative solutions to global issues, students take transformative action to allow them to see, understand, and engage with the world in a personal and meaningful way. And we, the real point of these programs is that we want students to understand that systemic change can be advanced through the arts and that the arts are a vehicle to create change. And it's an opportunity for students to connect with their voices and understand their agency and Ultimately, these programs are about process, not necessarily the art piece they create, but what they learn about themselves and human rights issues as they're creating their videos, as they're writing their songs, as they're developing these works of art, and what they do with those creations. How can they take their pieces into their communities and inspire and educate others? Um, in this photo here, you'll see um, one of our students, or actually four of our students, participating in our um, theater intensive in New York City. And this is one example of the trainings that we lead. They're in this photo performing the monologues from Ariel Dorfman's play Speak Truth to Power, which many of you already know of. Um, it's written by Ariel Dorfman, he's a Chilean playwright. And he took the interviews from Carrie Kennedy's book Speak Truth to Power, Human Rights Defenders Who Are Changing Our World and created a very moving play um, that I'll, I'll show you where it lives on our website so you can access it. And you'll also find additional monologues featuring powerful stories of additional human rights defenders. Um, and we'll get to those. I'll show you exactly where they live. And so that brings us to our materials. So aside from the play I just spoke about, we have the Defender monologues based on the lives and work of defenders featured in our lesson plans and also defenders who have won the Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights Award. Educators have used these monologues to create their own versions of the play, and they also incorporate monologues written by students into um, the monologues of the defenders and create their own um, unique pieces that they can share with their communities. We also have a theater lesson plan that uses parts of Ariel's play to help students identify how injustice affects the individual. It allows them to compare and contrast um, their own lives with those who have experienced injustices and it gives students an opportunity to empathize with human rights defenders as students are able to embody their stories. We also have a songwriting curriculum that was um, created in partnership with Grammy, the Grammy Museum and Rock Your World. And I'm going to explain all of them, what they are, and then I'm going to show you exactly how to access them. So if you have students who are entering the music contest, this is a really great tool to, to access. There are five lessons within this curriculum. And the first is about listening to songs as a human rights and social justice activist. And students are guided through the process of listening to and analyzing songs that inform, unite, and inspire and confront. So there's a list of songs that students can go to to kind of check out to have the sense as to what makes a powerful song about social justice. The second lesson is about listening to songs as a songwriter. And so students are guided through the process of reading songs um, to understand the name and the structure, the technique and devices, and annotating song lyrics to name specific structures and techniques. And then the third lesson is about composing music. So students start to explore the possibilities of their own songs. They start to kind of create their initial ideas and connect it to their purpose um, of their songs. 
And this section highlights the use of, of the writing process to compose, thinking of the audience in mind. And then the fourth is about what makes a themed chorus when you hear a song, what is it about that that really makes it stick in your mind, that you can't get it out of your head. Um, and it helps guide students as they start to revise their own choruses and start to really understand what their song is about and, and the story that they want to tell. And then the fifth is about poetic devices in songs. Um, a new part of our tools is our how-to manuals. And this is for educators and students who move, want to move beyond just mounting the play and just mounting the performance. And these manuals suggest opportunities to further educate and inspire audiences to take action. So the call to action is really about capitalizing the energy that's in a room after a production. And it gives audiences um, tangible steps that they can affect in order to affect change. Um, the how to talk back is an opportunity for cast members and directors to really engage with their audiences post performance. So it's a way um, to find out what the audience thought of the show, what really resonated with them, and to deepen the audience's understanding of the piece. Um, and then if a call to action is given to the audience, it's a really great way to explain the importance of that call to action and why it was selected by the students. Um, the other how-to is generating promotional partnerships. How can you identify partnerships that are mutually beneficial, making clear asks, cr cross-promoting, and then about how you can promote a performance, play considerations. And the purpose of this is to really put the power in the hands of the students so that they know that they can create a play, they can create the talkbacks, they can create the call to action, they can take action through the arts and really create change in their own community. So it's giving them the step-by-step -step instructions as to how to do that. And this year, we're going to be um, expanding our curriculum and developing lesson plans that focus on activists who defend and promote human rights through the arts including singer songwriters, filmmakers, and playwrights, but we're also expanding to spoken word, poetry, and visual artists, which are new me mediums that we will be bringing into our programming. And we'll also be adding an arts component to some of our existing lesson plans as become a part of Defender, become a Defender so that students have more options uh, and ways of taking action. Okay. All right, so let's go. I'm going to take you quickly through the website just to show you where you can find all of the things that I just spoke about. So when you go to rfkhumanrights.org, all of Speak Truths to Power work is housed under our work. And then you go to Teaching Human Rights. And this is where all of our materials live. So to find all of our lesson plans that Laura spoke about, you go to Defenders, and they're all listed right there. You can scroll down and you can also filter based on the grade level of students who will be, this le these lessons will be taught to. If you go to Contests, you can see our music contest and our video contest here. And I'll hit that in a few moments. And then to find all of our, our pieces, including the play, if you go to the landing page on Teaching Human Rights and scroll down, you'll find the play. If you click on the play icon, you can find performances of the play. And when you click on this, you'll be taken to the YouTube page where other videos will pop up with, uh, with student performances, with other um, professional actors performances. So you can really see the difference between student and professional productions. And I personally, I think the student um, performances are extraordinarily moving. So you'll find the full length versions of the play here in several different languages. And then beneath that, you'll find our additional monologues. And those are all of the monologues that are in addition to Ariel Dorfman's play that you can find. Okay. So training. I mentioned briefly um, about the theater training that we, we hold in New York City. And in the, the theater intensive, um, students develop their own versions of the play using the Defender monologues that I just showed you on the web, website, as, um, as well as monologues written by students 
based on the work of human rights defenders that really resonate with them. Sometimes they're in their community. Sometimes they're defenders that they've seen on the news where they're really taken by their work and they decide that they want to learn more about the defender. So they start to research. And students really spend a lot of time researching these defenders before they write monologues to incorporate into their own versions of the play. Um, the image that you see here is one of my favorite theater camps we ever held. It was in 2016 in response to the election. And students were taught about different forms of street theater and they put together their play. They, some of the defenders were in our, our existing repertoire. Some were defenders that they found um, who were really speaking out against the election. They wrote their own pieces and we took it to the streets and it was so cool to see the kids find these spaces and really speak truth to power um, to strangers. And it was a really, uh, it was a very moving week for all of us. Um, one of my favorite trainings. And the images on the left are from a training we, did, we just did in Mexico at the end of February. Um, wow. So how do I start? This was such an amazing event. And Karen, if you want to chime in at any point, feel free. But this was like a very moving experience for me. Um, there are a lot of attacks on journalists in Mexico, and I think it's like 60,000 people have gone missing. Is that right, Karen? Well, specifically women. Women. Yeah. Um, and so the, these attacks on journalists and human rights defenders in Mexico is evidence of a crackdown on civic space. And we really wanted to raise um, awareness about the issue and the important work carried out, carried out by the, the human rights defenders in Mexico. So we had the support of USAID and a program called Provoces, and we hosted a workshop called Speak Truth to Power Theater Training of Trainers. And so throughout this training, university theater companies were given the tools to develop their, um, their own version of the Speak Truth to Power play on their campuses based on the work and lives of human rights defenders from their own cities. And so educators and students um, from all over Mexico were present for a training that was two days long. And they spent most of their time writing these, these monologues based on the work of two human rights defenders from their communities while having conversations with each other about, you know, what, what makes a monologue effective? How do you discern which details of the lives of the defenders should be included in the pieces? And then they worked and worked on their, their monologues, they worked on the staging, and then they prepared, their, they showed their pieces to each other. And as each university performed um, their, their original monologues based on the lives of their local defenders, all of the participants offered their constructive feedback for each piece to illuminate what worked, what could have been improved, how best to honor and re represent the lives and the work of each defender featured. And then the participants took um, the lessons that they learned back to their universities where they, they started to create and at some point will hopefully um, develop a full length production of the play that they will um, stage at their universities. Karen, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I mean, I would just say that as, as many of you have probably experienced and, and look forward to us talking about your experiences, but the arts, particularly theater, create a place where, I mean, most of these people um, knew some of the, particularly the women that they wrote about um, or knew their story very closely. And it just creates a very safe space to be vulnerable and to be open and to, um, to create understanding and awareness of very, very difficult um, subjects in a way that, that so many other mediums don't allow for and that advocacy may not um, it can spark advocacy in ways that other things can. So it was, it was really powerful. Um, and so as we further develop our arts program, we're really going to um, kind of expand our programming this year. We will be incorporating additional art forms, including visual arts, as I mentioned before, poetry, spoken word, where the objective will be for students to develop projects that have community impact and experience meaningful transformation in the process. And these programs will be rooted in the history of the different mediums of art so that students understand how um, works have really influenced society, how they've raised awareness of, of social and political issues. And then students will develop their own research-based projects that will lead to creating a song or a video or poem or a visual art piece. And then students will develop ways to further educate their peers and community with the pieces of art that they've created. So as I mentioned, we're in the, pr the process of developing these training materials and we can't wait to share them with you. 
when they're ready to go. Okay, so that brings us to our contests. And these are currently um, two programs that exist where students can take action. Um, so the Speak Up, Sing Out music contest is a partnership with the Grammy Museum. Um, and it was created to display how music can be a powerful vehicle to affect change. And for the past four years, this contest has, has amplified the voices of hundreds of students who use this platform to raise awareness. And some of you on here, some of your students have um, submitted songs for the contest. Chris Buckley, I'm, I'm talking to you. Some really, really beautiful pieces that your kids have submitted. Um, and submissions are, are judged by a panel of Grammy nominated artists, including Aloe Black and Rocky Dewani, which is so cool. Um, and the video contest began in 2010. And this year, um, it's in partnership with the Tribeca Film Festival. Previously, it was the Institute. This year, it's the festival. We had such a cool um, presentation set where it was going to be a time for young um, human rights defenders to get together and share all the work that they've been doing in their communities. Unfortunately, that's not happening this year. Um, and traditionally, the winning film is premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival. We will find a, an awesome alternative. We're working on it. So this year, it's a great opportunity for students to respond to the COVID crisis and advise human rights issues that they've been thinking about or that have come up with them, such as the right to information and the right to healthcare. Um, so if you have students who are looking for something to do, this is a great project to get them involved in. Okay, so let's go back to the website. So when you click on the contests link, it takes you to both contests. And I'm gonna play for you um, a little bit of the winner from last year. Her name is Tess Lira. She was 14 years old when she wrote her song. All right, so I'm gonna play a little bit of her video for you now. It's been to power. Hi, my name is Tess Lira, and I'm a 2019 Speak Up, Sing Out songwriting contest winner. I think in our society that age can be a really big barrier, and because of your age, people can underestimate you. And so me writing this song was basically saying that even though I'm 14, I still have a voice, and my voice should still be heard. My song is basically about angst, and you know, I see a lot of social injustice around me a lot of the time, and especially being a teenager, there's a lot of anxiety that comes with school and friend groups and all that, and everybody thinks that's the biggest issue going on. And sometimes I have to take a step back and say, well, this isn't even the biggest issue. There's so many other things to be upset about. And when I started to acknowledge all the other things going on in life, then I really felt that I had more of a touch with what to write about. And I wrote it just to get all of my feelings out on the paper and, you know about how I could stand up for myself and inspire other people to stand up for themselves versus just letting it slide and ignoring it and thinking since it doesn't affect me that I shouldn't relate to it. Okay, so that was just a little bit about her process, how she wrote her song, and you could hear a little bit of it in the background. Um, and because we're running a little bit short on time and I wanna make sure we have time to have a dialogue, I'm gonna jump ahead to the video contest and just show a, a small clip of our winner from this past year, Rodney Glasgow. And this is a, um, students from the George School in Newtown, PA created this, this piece. So just a super short clip I'll play for you. Each time a man stands up for an ideal, or acts to improve the lot of others, or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring. Those ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. All right, class, so for this assignment, I want you to be inspired by RFK's work and his legacy. To that end, I'm going to have you make a short documentary about a human rights defender in your community, but I want it to be something that speaks to you and makes you believe that you can defend human rights in your community. I wasn't sure which human right to decide for my project, so I spoke with my friend about it to see which one would be the best, and after some research, I decided to go with Article 19, Freedom of Speech, because I think it really resonated with me and my experience as a Black woman. 
Afterwards, I went to my advisor, Rebecca, and we discussed more about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the freedom of speech, and she brought up a fascinating name that was shockingly familiar, Rodney Glasgow. And then I remembered that I met him at the diversity conference earlier this year and eager to learn more about what he had to say about the freedom of speech. I reached out to him and he said yes. Right. Yeah. So this is a great example of students reaching out to a human rights defender and getting them involved in the video that they make. Um, and as you can see, the students are asked to make a video that connects the work of Bobby Kennedy to the work of the t defender while linking in uh, the UDHR. So. If you want to check out more videos, you can look at our, our YouTube page and see um, past winners from the beginning of time just to get a sense of, of what makes a winning, a video a winning video. Okay, so back to the slideshow. So those are our contests. The deadlines are the 15th. Um, and don't feel terrified of not having the equipment the, the filming equipment or the editing equipment. It's the, it's the message that's the most important part. And if you have students who really wanna speak up about a human rights issue that they care about, encourage them to do so. They can make very beautiful, moving, powerful films with just a smartphone. And we, have a, um, we had a presentation last week about how to do that, tips and techniques for using your smartphone. And um, we'll send that link along as well if you wanna forward that to your students. Okay, so discovery education. So, um, in our partnership, we're now able to reach over 30 million students. And if you visit the website, speaktruthtopowerinschool.com, you'll find virtual field trips, interactive maps, a video vignette series, and um, some lesson plans that we're working on. So this is what the website looks like, Speak Truth to Power in School. And I'm going to skip ahead to our um, master class series. So if you go to educator resources, you'll see the masterclass series there. And you'll see some of our extraordinary lead educators highlighted. Chris Buckley's on here. He's also on our call right now. Um, so you come back and check out Chris, Chris's video. Um, but right now I'm going to play for you our amazing Estella's um, uh, masterclass series video. My name is Estella Oima Church. I teach English and theater in South Los Angeles. We are focused on offering up really good suggestions. And Speak Truth to Power is a great resource and tool that I go straight to when I'm looking to make sure that my kids have windows and mirrors. Windows and mirrors is this idea in education that um, children deserve to see themselves in everything it is that they study but also a very authentic way of viewing other people or being introduced to other perspectives and worldviews. If there is a unit that doesn't have enough in it, I can go straight to you know, a defender, find one that fits this content or this topic, and plug them in. The Speak Truth to Power lessons that my kids resonate with the most are the young people. Um, so they're favorite by far is Malala Yousafzai. Students are absolutely and immediately inspired and full of fire um, to support her cause or other causes, you know, like it. What are some of your initial thoughts or concepts? That Giving have? students the whole picture and context and making sure that they see themselves and their history and, and, and heritage in that story is an important part of my job. For them to truly be inquisitive and curious about the world, that motivation has to come from within. Okay, because we're running short on time and because I really want to introduce her to you, um, I'm going to stop it there and I'm going to introduce you to Estella who is on the, the call with us. Um, she was a Barkey Foundation Global Teacher Prize finalist in 2017. And she um, helps youth employ performing arts as a community service tool, an education consultant, as well as a reading curriculum and pathway specialist. So without much further ado, I'd like Estella to speak a little bit about how she 
uses the arts in her classroom and how she's currently using Speak Truth to Power materials. Hello, afternoon everyone. Um, hope everyone's doing well. Uh, thank you, Jenny. Um, so, uh, my thoughts are just a little bit all over the place, but <laughs> here we go. Um, so teaching the arts uh, with a social justice and human rights lens, I think is super beneficial for tons of reasons. Um, some of those reasons, uh, arts integration is beneficial in any content area. So I, I, I kind of I kind of feel like content area grade level is like not too relevant um, because if we're we're moving from an arts integration point of view or or focus on the arts and human rights or social justice ed, we're able to to go very very deep and far um, within each of our content areas or our grade level. Um, it allows us to embed the SEL competencies. Um, it gives you room and freedom to focus on a social or racial justice lens. We can embed sustainable development goals. Human rights education is definitely easy to fit in there. Um, we can deepen conversations and dialogue in a way that other classroom strategies might not allow us to. Uh, and we can elevate student voices and give them a real, a real platform, freedom of expression, autonomy, utility. They find value in what they're, they're doing and learning. And in that way, we're able to uh, increase students intrinsic motivation um, it's a great tool to keep kids from or it's a great tool to help kids move from classroom dialogue and and beyond our classroom and into the community to take actual steps like physical tangible steps in action um, and it helps us remain culturally responsive to our kids to their learning spaces and to whatever is happening right now in our neighborhoods um, if you are familiar with the National Core Art Standards. Uh, those ask that students are creating, responding, presenting, and connecting. And the word empathy is explicit in our in the National Core Art Standards. And so, with the a human rights lens, empathy then becomes a part of of any and everything that we're doing in our classroom. Um, and Jenny mentioned that, like the, she said process uh, that the the human rights education framework or lens that it's about the process. And if you're an arts educator, then you know that it's also about the process, that, that the arts, no matter what fine art you're, you're working in, that you're probably more focused or in tuned with the way your students are moving along through their process before they get to the final performance or the final recital. Um, and so it's, it's the same concept in the arts. And so they sort of align very well in that way. Um, in terms of Speak Truth to Power materials that we're using in our classroom, uh, my students and I were first introduced through the play. Uh, we were looking for um, a piece to do and, and I had been introduced to Speak Truth to Power and so it was the piece I wanted to take to my kids and that was, that was years ago. Um, and the model or the, the new materials, the how-to that Jenny pointed out, that's essentially where we started. That's, that was our model and, and the first year that we, we introduced Speak Truth to Power, um, my students wanted a way to, here's, here's how the rehearsal process went for them. They dug into the script. It was very painful and it was hard to face all those stories at once and then do it day after day in, during the rehearsal process. Um, and so at some point my kids started to not want to come to rehearsals. They were just sort of hurt to, to think about everything that was going on. Um, and so when I had a talk with them about it, about the rehearsal process and ask, checking in with them to see what was going on, they explained all of that to me, that, that they were just sad, that you know, drama is the place that they come to have fun and doing the piece, was, it was just sad to, to think about everything that's going on in the world and around them. And so they decided um, that they were going to do restorative justice circles at the end of each play so that they could sort of uplift themselves and uplift the neighborhood, the community who came to watch the show. And so that sort of became our model after every show. Even if it was a comedy, we would include a community talk back or a restorative justice circle. Um, and, that, and once we got through that, through Speak Truth to Power, we then started doing um, a style of theater called verbatim, verbatim theater, which allowed students to create their own plays from scratch on issues that they want to talk about 
in a very similar way that Ariel Dorfman wrote and created Speak Truth to Power. Um, and so they interview local defenders and, and folks or that are important to them, close to them, on issues that are important to them, close to them. And then we we create, you know, um, 10 minute plays or sometimes longer, but uh, 10 minute plays around the issues that matter to them. Um, we've used the film contest in the past. We start every school year with examining the UDHR. Um, as a matter of fact, I don't finish the syllabus and hand it to kids the first week of school. I wait until the students have dug into the UDHR as their first text of my class, and then they create their own UDHR for our classroom, and that's how we finish off the syllabus before I send it home with parents. Um, we've, uh, I've done things where um, whatever unit or lesson I'm teaching, I just pull pieces or defender stories and, and fit them into our, our lesson. Um, last year, we were studying Julius Caesar, working on uh, rhetoric, rhetorical appeals and devices, and I went straight to Malala's speech at the UN and pulled her story and included it into our unit. Um, so the, the Speak Truth to Power materials and resources are very malleable, uh, easy to adapt, um, and when we're, we're using the arts, we can create very full experiences um, for learners in, in our classroom spaces. Um, and then shameless plug for theater, um, because theater arts, I think, is the one art form that includes almost every medium that you can think of. Um, there's kind of an endless potential there. Um, almost anything your kids could imagine or think up or want to talk about, there's a space for it on the stage. Um, and the word stage is, is loose. We can create a performance space any and everywhere you want to create a performance space. Um, so I, I think I've covered everything you wanted me to mention, Jenny, and there, there we go. Thank you so much, that was awesome. Um, I love that, I love that the materials are malleable and I love that, yes, you can perform art anywhere. When we took the play to Mexico City, Diego Luna said, you can perform it in your backyard, and he's right, you can form, perform the play anywhere. Okay, so, to wrap things up, well, my computer's freezing. Um, so we have um, a, a, the final installation of the Zooming for HRE um, is, oh, I'm not sure why the slides are freezing. There it is, okay. Um, is Monday, May 18th. And then we have our Defender Speaker Series coming up the 14th through the, the 10th of June, where students can interface with a human rights defender. So we'll send that link out so you can send it to your students so they can register. It's going to be amazing. Mm -hmm. um, but for now, do we have any, any questions? Did anyone raise any questions during the presentation? No? No questions? Um, does anyone, can anyone think of human rights defenders who are involved in the arts who you think we should incorporate into our programming? Is there anyone that you think students would really resonate with after hearing our, our presentation? Does anyone come to mind? Um, I, can you hear me? Yes. Um, Estelle, I thought what you said was, was she still there? Great. I, I really wish I could teach theater. Um, I teach English. And I just um, find that one of the challenges that I've had as an educator, Eng English educator, is the standardized testing that's required. Um, and trying to figure out a way to be creative with that. And one of the things that I've tried to do is front load central ideas uh, from texts theme thematic and central ideas and have the students visually interpret that um, and then write poetry about that central idea. So poetry is like a lost art form and it's certainly not in standardized testing as far as writing your own poem, but they do have to analyze poetry. So as Stella mentioned earlier, you know, connecting, making a connection with the students' own lives to the central ideas in the defender stories and then be connected to other texts that are district required. I, yeah, thanks, thanks Pam. Um, I teach English too. Um, and I would, I would say that you could 
or I, I would argue, and I, I mean, every administration is different, so you do what you gotta do. But um, I would argue that you could put up almost any text in your English classroom as a piece of theater. Um, I, I taught a ninth grade English class called uh, Language Takes the Stage, where that's, that's what we did. Um, it was definitely English nine, but a focus on performance um, or, or just, just standing up with the text and, and putting the text to work. So, um, and I would, analyzing poetry and getting up on their feet and speaking those words loud, like that's performance and um, probably bit more beneficial to the kids than sitting at their desk talking about rhetorical or poetic devices. They should get up and use poetic devices. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. I think um, the monologues were the most powerful to me in, in, in all the Defender stories. I think the two that always come to my mind first and forefront is Harry Wu and Kasawa. Um, even when I taught those stories in Haiti at um, uh, Zomni Beni, I, the kids just, just gravitated towards those two particularly, even in my, my classrooms here. And um, I, I found that when we, they did speak the monologues and we did speak the, um, share the monologues out loud, it was very powerful that way. So thanks for your ideas. Absolutely. And I would, I know we lost Jenny, but I, I would really love to emphasize the question that she asked. Um, you know, as we develop this workout more, we know that there, I mean, I'm thinking of, oh my gosh, my brain, I'm claiming senior brain right now, the lead ballerina in New York. Um, um, what is her name? African-American lead ballerina. Misty Copeland. Misty Copeland. Like her, like her, she comes right to mind to me, even though her name didn't. Um, I, I was dealing with a sick dog all morning, so I'm a little frazzled today. But like uh, it would be really empowering or powerful for us if you all would share from across mediums, folks who you think we should really dive deeper into in developing um, some of these lessons because I think today we see the importance, I think it was mentioned, the importance of art um, when things get tough. So, so does anybody have any kind of initial ideas or thoughts of some of those folks we should be highlighting? Yeah, there's a, there's a young artist, uh, I think she's based here in LA, her name's Ashley Lu Lukashevsky. I'm gonna type it now, but yeah. <laughs> she's been featured in quite a few um, exhibits here. We have this pop-up exhibit here in LA called into action and then the second installment was we rise and the focus was on mental health on that second one we rise but now they're doing it digital on on instagram a lot of the artists who are involved with those projects are probably great artists to start with but um yeah ashley she's she's got some great some great stuff she's a visual artist i'll type her name in the chat now brilliant i saw dick you raised your hand uh, just, you know, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on some of the names as you were apparently. Um, <laughs> but, you know, right now, I mean, there are, um, you know, around the, the, uh, the virus, there are just a handful of, of people who are in the arts who are doing some tremendous fundraising and, and volunteering. And it would be a really good opportunity, I think, to, uh, you know, to, to add one or two of those, I think, mm -hmm. uh, mostly because the students would connect with the name pretty quickly, and I think that that would be an advantage. And if I could move away from the arts just for a second, it's as I was thinking of a name, I was also thinking of uh, uh, Chef Andres, which at this point would yeah. probably be a tremendous person uh, to add to the list. And again, names that uh, right now are going to probably. Um, ring a bell to a young person who's, um, you know, who's just looking at what we're doing. Mm -hmm. I put the, the name of Stella, uh, I'm sorry, after Stella, Dom, uh, Dom, um, Dominic Esposito. He's a Connecticut artist who created a giant spoon um, and put it in front of Purdue Pharma to reflect the, um, the, the kind of the scourge of, of heroin abuse and, and, uh, in, in this country oh, wow. and um, he was arrested and but it was a massive 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 spoon heroin spoon that he put in the middle of Stanford it's kind of an interesting for you know he's more of a local artist for Connecticut folks but um, if you're looking for local people 
I know people are probably going to have to jump and I see Jenny back on, but I, one of the things I would love to hear from you all is, is, you know, we've talked about this, but how have arts helped you now or in the past or whatever medium, like for me personally, I've been driving around in my car with the lap, with my music so loud and just blasting songs that to me make me feel, um, sometimes I do it to cry, sometimes I do it to laugh, and some, most of the time I just do it to, to not give a shit and just sing as loud as I can and I'll go for a drive and that helps. I'd be interested to hear from the rest of you just kind of the way that arts kind of are helping you through this now or maybe some other time. And I recognize people might have to jump off. So, but I, I think it's, that's what we're talking about, right? I play every day, man. I rock out with my kids day, daily, every day of my life. Um. It's required, seriously. That keeps them sane as well. We, we, we just started kind of being able to go outside again but it's still highly restricted here in, in Madrid. And um, yeah, man, it's just, it's that thing we kind of do. My, my daughter, she grabs, I have a mandolin, which she can't play. I mean, she's, she's five, but um, it's small enough that she can hold it. So she grabs that and I've got like a smaller acoustic guitar. My, my son's left-handed, so he's totally screwed, but um, he grabs it anyway. He just kind of strums along. It sounds, it sounds horrible, but it's really <laughs> enriching regardless, you know? So it's fun. I'm going to jump off here in a second, but I would just add that I use, I use the arts a ton with my students just, um, you know, to give them another medium to be able to engage with the stuff. Um, when I do, I'm doing my civil rights unit coming up and, and uh, even though uh, Norman Rockwell wasn't necessarily himself the greatest embodiment of all these things, um, there's a really great uh, image of uh, Ruby Bridges and it's called the, the, the Hate We we own or something like that but it's a picture mm -hmm. of her walking yeah. and it just lets the kids um really kind of see the material without having to to read it and kind of engage with the emotion of it and uh, i do a lot with that i think it's a, a really incredible way for kids who don't necessarily see themselves as artists uh, or don't think they have artistic ability to be able to see how other people engage with stuff so um because i would i would I lump myself in with those people who don't have musical or artistic ability, but, you know, can, can see how other people would be able to do that. So I, I think, you know, what, what Estella does with her kids and, and, you know, all that kind of stuff is just, is just great for other kids to see. And, um, you know, so I, I would just throw that out there. There's some good stuff, even though the artists like, like I teach Dr. Seuss, also not a great example of somebody who would exude tolerance when he was doing most of his work. Um, but he has some great messaging. So if you teach that stuff, there's a great way of getting kids to, to see the important values. So that's how I would look at it. You know, Karen, just, um, just playing off what you were saying, you know, about music and things right now, Estella, you might agree with me on this, that, you know, given a conversation we had the other night about, you know, Zoom fatigue, the ability to actually do something other than a screen <laughs> to get into acting or singing um, after this stretch, which has been so long for everybody to just go to a different medium and the weather hopefully improving so that they could really um, express themselves. I think there's a, there's a real opportunity there um, that lines it up with the whole you know, uh, challenges that everyone's facing. For sure. I can't wait to not look at the screen. <laughs> I'm tired of Zoom. Um, uh, something that we're doing in my class right now, we're in the middle of our poetry unit, and um, uh, it's hard for teachers who are dealing with remote learning. You spend half the time sitting in your call waiting on a kid to, to show up. Um, but I've tried to rework it as best as I can, so we're doing I've invited all these guest speakers to do like live podcast in our class. Um, and so far poetry unit, I've had some authors and uh, spoken word artists tune in once a week. And so instead of class being me teaching, 
the kids are coming to this podcast, live podcast session um, that I can record and then email to everyone who didn't show up. And so I'm getting like 10 to 15 kids to <laughs> log in, which is better than the two I get when I'm, it's me by myself. Um, and so that's that has been a fun, interesting way for them to talk about poetry. But I've been getting text messages from kids who are like, miss that poem we had to listen to or read oh it was so good like they're they're able to just sort of let some of their emotions out right now and they're not focused on the grade at the moment and they're just feeling the poetry which is how poetry is meant to be and so that's um hey chris um so that's been that's been good that one positive is remote learning I wanted to add also, when, when I used to be in the classroom, I, I was guilty definitely of the days when I was not prepared. I want to play a documentary in the classroom. But there, this is a time where I think asking them to watch film, I mean, we were talking about Scream, but there's, there's for, the, for the kids that have the ability to do so, um, really changing the way they are looking at film, like as an educator, are we choosing films to then direct them to watch? to build on that social emotional learning standpoint of building compassion and empathy and an awareness of another walk in life and looking about is is a black female portrayed as a, as a heroine how often are they seeing that in film and showing it in the lack of that or or is there a certain demographic that's that we're asked to walk in their shoes more often than someone else uh, and like or using film to compare and contrast different events and asking them to look at it through facilitated, um, kind of like a scavenger hunt of watching film and really answering questions as they're watching it, but more as a way to that practice that empathy piece. And um, one of the best things that someone told me when watching documentaries is like, not to, not to go in to act like you're gonna walk out of watching that documentary and you know what it's like to walk in that person's shoes, but that you understand how to walk beside someone because you can't ever really say, oh, now I understand what it's like to be so-and-so because I watched this eye-opening film, but like, do you understand what it means to be an ally now after watching that film and not act like you know what it's like? And so practicing those social emotional skills during film and uh, through guided questions, I think we have more time than ever to do that now with some of our students. Anyone else? Yeah, as, yeah. Um, there are so many amazing free performances now that are available. Um, Shakespeare, yeah, the Shakespeare Theatre Company, the National Theatre in, in England is um, streaming a lot of live shows and that's really been healing. Um, and yeah, I mean, and for me, watching all of the musicians play in the streets, I mean, and, and I, I keep going back to the videos of, of the opera singers singing on their balcony and, and other people participating, you know, there's a, a cellist on one balcony and a saxophone player on another, and they're just kind of improvising at the same time. But in order to improvise, you have to be at a certain place and you have to be open and you have to be receptive. And I think that's the beauty of art and that's where it puts you in that place where you can be open and receptive and, and have that dance with that person who's not next to you, but you, you're speaking the same language. I think it's such a beautiful and healing place to be. And especially in, in this time, this, you know, where we are right now, we're not able to have that connection watching those videos, at least for me feels when it's over, I feel healed. I feel like I've taken a nap or, or had some time to like rest my, my spirit so that's that's what music has been doing for me. Any final thoughts? No. Well, I, I just want to shout out to Stella. We joined for a little while the prom. We were on. It was you. so much fun. It was awesome. So for you, those of you that may not know, Stella almost single-handedly. Um, organized a prom this weekend, and it was really fun. I was introduced some new DJs, heard some nice thoughtful commentary. It was fun. Thank you, thank you. We should have a full we should have a full vibe up soon, and I'll 
I'll email everyone the full vibe. We got we got kicked off a couple times, a couple times. So, well, I have a full vibe for everyone soon. Congrats! Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Estella, for coming and sharing your story and, and all the things you've been doing in your classroom with us. It's so nice to see all of the familiar faces who've been here. And, and Mitra, we hope that you get involved and reach out to us if you have any questions or, or need anything. Um, don't forget, we have a, our final installation of the Zooming for HRE next week. We have the Defender Series coming up. We're here if you need us. Um, we love you all. We're, we're so grateful to have you as part of our, our clan. And um, mm -hmm. speak truth to power, everyone. See you all. Bye. 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 Bye.